Welcome Wargamers, join your hosts, Falco and Monty, two Canadian wargaming enthusiasts, as we explore all aspects of tabletop wargaming. We roll dice, talk tactics, share hobby hacks, and explore new tabletop systems, all on the Trident Wargaming Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Trident Wargaming. Uh, again, we're doing some bolt action and making his return, Mr. Jason. That's uh, my electric loot. Your electric loot. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone on an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm the weirdest. Anyway. <laughs> so it's, uh, as we're recording, it's a little late. For when we're recording, so we're probably a little tired, but uh, bear with us. We might get a little goofy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, a little bit of bolt action tonight. Uh, we've got a couple of topics to uh, to go over and whatnot. Um, that's kind of uh, rarely used in the game, at least locally for us in the game. Uh, and then there's one familiar uh, little topic that we uh, will go into about as well. <laughs> Um, but, uh, the three, three topics really are, um, the use of, uh, smoke in, in our games of bolt action, uh, the outflanking maneuvers that you can uh, use. And then of course the recce ability with some of the vehicles out there. So, um, should be a good one. Should be, uh, helpful, you know, tips and knowledge of of kind of these uh, topics and see where we go. But first to the hobby front. How's, how's Jason's hobby front going? It's a slow slog, <laughs> but uh, you know, we played a game of the black powder, uh, Epic civil war, uh, you know, a quasi game. Yep. And it has uh, enticed me into working on those guys again. So nice. I'm back at it. Nice. Pulling all and, the uh, brigades out and everything. Getting everything it set up. Very little progress, but trying at least. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear that. I've been, uh, I've been 3d printing, uh, Normandy buildings terrain for, for, uh, bolt action. So been working it's on that. Good. Yeah, got. Uh, I think I'm up to seven buildings now, all varying from single story to two story. So um, slowly, slowly working on terrain, and then eventually, what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll lay out um, I'll lay out uh, a, a map kind of thing, uh, one of the mats, and uh, set it out and see what I need for for everything. One Sweet. of these one of these days, I'm gonna have to like go hard on doing the bacage. And just get it done. But yeah. Uh, the bacage is a bit of a chore, isn't it? It can be, but I mean if I I think if I um uh line it up kind of thing and, and get yeah. just certain things done one day, certain things done the next day, and then throughout the week maybe work on one, you know, each day or every couple of days work on one. So but it'll be it'll be interesting and who knows, maybe come winter time when I got some time off I'll be uh hammering that out too but other Sweet. than that uh just a couple of other hobbies been painting some stuff uh for slow grow of ours and um been doing a few really just a few demo games and whatnot you know as the sarge for the store there uh, a couple of new players kind of creeping in and wanting to check out the game and uh yeah of course podcasting all the time right so Sweet. Um, I do. Well, I do really need to get back to doing some unboxings, um, as you can see behind me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, just a lot of kits that I can go through. Uh, just time wise, trying to get stuff done. But I really do need to get back to those. Uh, a lot of people enjoyed them, and I think it helps a lot of people because I've had a lot of guys, even at the store, like lately. Uh, they come in and they start asking tons of questions about, you know, what's what's in these box sets and this and that, or I'm looking for this box set or the Canadian 
British and Canadian box set. What's on the sprue? Well, if you check out this video, <laughs> right? So it's kind of, uh, kind of where that's at. Um, yeah. Otherwise just plugging along. Um, got to build a couple armies for, for, um, the next demo match. So it'll be good. So, um, Sweet. you guys, you know, whatever you guys are working on, share it with us, post it on our page, you know, uh, PM, whatever. Um, we always like to see what you guys are working on. And a lot of times, uh, we see some really, really nice looking painted models or even converted or even the scenic bases and stuff that people love to do. Um, so yeah, we love to see pictures like that too. So make me feel bad about my progress. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Oh, good. Everybody has their pace, right? So, um, that, that is one thing I, I got to admit though, is I, I do have a friend. He, uh, he doesn't play bolt action. Um, but he does play, uh, one of the other systems and he's just jumped back into, into the, the larger scale gaming, you know, some of the systems <clears throat> and, uh, but he struggles with painting. Mm -hmm. So I was kind enough to say, Hey, you know what? You've put some, you use some contrast paints on your Marines, stuff like that. They look great. This is kind of is your your deal, and um, if you want, if you're a little intimidated by the vehicles because they are larger surface, right? And I go, come on over, I'll airbrush them for you. So by doing that, it's actually really inspired him to keep going with painting, mm -hmm. um, especially with all the little details because like the base work was done with the with the airbrushing, but now he's putting in the time to do the details. And then I showed him a, I showed him a way of how to do a, like a wash with a AK enamel. Nice. And, um, I, I took one of his Marines and slopped it on and took it off and he loved it. So I was like, that's how easy it is to do. Right. So, um, but yeah, that's hobby time. <laughs> ba -dum -bum. Yeah. So. So I guess to start off, let's let's start off with some smoke. Not that smoke, the other smoke. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so we don't see it a lot in our games, um, and I don't know if it's just if it's overlooked, or maybe it's not that useful to people. But I don't know. Uh, going over the rules for it and checking out some of the armies um not every army would really really benefit from it some are one more than others um as probably a lot of bolt action veteran players know you know uh, a japanese army um mm -hmm. they do have a couple of units that actually have multiple light mortar teams within units so as a as an example um it's uh i think it's an iga grenadier squad and also a snlf <coughs> grenadier squad um they both have access to three of them expensive i think they're 25 points a piece um but having three of those in a squad and being able to fire smoke could be quite a benefit for your army, especially if you're trying to screen a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So a little example of, of, I guess how smoke really works is, um, so howitzers and mortars can indirect fire, um, on a fixed point, just like if they're picking another target or whatever, but this time it's a fixed point on the table, you still need sixes to hit. Um, I believe if you're stationary, you'll get a bonus of plus one to hit. Um, but depending on the, uh, type of howitzer or mortar, um, increases the size of the smoke template that you're going to put down. So a light mortar is three inches, a medium mortar and a light howitzer is four. Uh, a heavy mortar and a medium howitzer is five inches, and then a heavy howitzer is six inches. Now, 
the nice thing about smoke is um, it counts as soft cover pretty much when you're in it. And it also counts as dense terrain. So it blocks your line of line of sight. So real good screening mechanic. Um, buddy has a tiger two on the field. Well, if you pop smoke in front of them and you actually get it, you hit, well, now he can't see shit. Right? Now you're forcing his hand to move kind of thing. Um, the downfall with it is that you still need a six to hit. So if it doesn't hit, the opposing player can relocate it 12 inches from its original position of where you had placed it. So it could work, yeah. totally work against you, right? Um, but if you've got enough of it on the board, there's a good chance you're going to have an interesting screen on the board, right? So, um, so, so the main part of it is, you know, your mortars and howitzers. That's what will give you these options for smoke. So, as you, as I said before, the Japanese unit has three in a squad. So, if you take multiple squads, now you got six. Now, you know what I mean. You got a lot. Yeah. Right? In in my mind, really, the biggest downfall besides, you know, not being entirely likely to hit. Yeah. Is it's a fairly small template it is right so you're not going to obscure a whole lot i think besides that pretty much that scenario that you set up or maybe obscuring enemy artillery making them move yeah uh or especially if you can obscure a heavy gun you know mm -hmm. uh uh, maybe there, but really needing that uh, uh, six, maybe a five, if you, if I remember correctly, if you've uh, stayed still, and the small template just doesn't seem worthwhile. Perhaps for the Japanese shooting three, you're pretty likely to get at least one. Yeah, um, and and maybe you'll get lucky and get all three, and that's uh, hey. You know, you can actually make a, a fairly decent sized uh, screen there. Yeah, if they all, if they, you know, if they ended up all hitting, which is yeah. more, more than unlikely, um, you know, that that could technically be, a, you could technically place it like a a nine inch wall, right? Yeah. A piece of yeah. dense terrain. Um, now, but pretty it, unlikely. That's the, well, that's exactly. the pickle. That's, ex that's exactly the thing, right? So, so what do you do? Do you do you, like if it's an open field? Well, good luck, right? Uh, is there some kill zones or some gaps in the terrain that maybe you want to plug up with that? Then sure, maybe maybe that you know that uh, MMG is on uh, on ambush. Mm -hmm. Throw throw smoke there if you can or whatever, right? Stuff like that. Um, is it super reliable? No, 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 it's not. Um, no, if it works, I mean, it, it, if it works, it works, but yeah, at the same time, the smoke just doesn't disappear next yeah. turn, right? So it might take you two turns to get like a really good screen going. Um, but yeah, overall, like, you know, on your next turn, you actually have to roll to see what happens. And on a one, it, the smoke just dissipates and goes away. And uh, on a two, all the smoke drifts D6. So in a, in a random direction, right? And then, you know, on a, on a three plus, it just stays put. So, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those tactics and whatnot that I would definitely have to play it myself a fair bit to really, really see how effective it's going to be. Um, I know one of her uh, older friends there that uh, was playing Japan uh, a long time ago, he would use it in some of his larger games, and it, it did work pretty decent for him. But, um, you know, that's one player out of, out of how many, right? So mm -hmm. um, other than that, it's kind of, 
the other there's a couple other options uh from it for units that can fire um so literally any vehicle that has a mounted can fire you know a howitzer can fire it um you have a forward artillery observer that can fire smoke it's i personally think it's not worth it no so uh you i'd rather do the other one that puts pins or damage and then um I know the French have their uh, VB launchers. They're considered light mortars or yeah, light mortars. So that works. I can try that, right? I can have some squads with multiple VB launchers. You know, and a light, a light mortar, you can move and shoot. So that's why you're not, uh, you're not stationary you're not you know you're not locking that unit up at least yeah i i'm thinking that it's a situation where i don't have anything else to shoot at and maybe i'll try for smoke but i i don't see going yeah. for it but then again i'm not a genius at this game well let's be honest i think i think um <laughs> i think with like the japanese because their whole thing is to get close and engage yeah, they'd be um, they'd be worth looking at it, especially with the three, you know, you know, or with you know, all the mortars you can take, right? Well, and and the way I'm thinking about it too, for the <clears throat> Japanese is like, so you're you're screening, you're making these screens, you're pushing up with your units, you're also using these screens to protect your your suicide uh, bombers, pretty much. Yeah. Right? Um, against tanks. So they're trying to run in there. Like everything's running, doing the bonsai charge kind of thing. And you're firing these smoke bombs, pretty much mortars every turn as you're advancing. You're just thump, thump, let her rip, right? So now you have all these screens kind of everywhere. And uh, But here's the question. Do you run or advance? Because if you're running, you're not shooting. So yeah. maybe maybe it's an idea where you have one with three, you know, a squad with three of them in it, supporting the guys that are running up to do the up close and personal, touchy touchy, yeah. touchy fighting. <laughs> that's 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 my apparently my new word for fighting. There you go. Yeah, it's it's something we'd have to put to the test, right? Um, might have to talk with two. Uh... To our friend Jordan there, he plays some Japanese. See if he can uh, try it out one time or get my Japanese built and, and do it. But um, there's not many, there's not many armies that have multiple light mortars in units. No. Um, you might get one in a unit somewhere. Um, also, I mean, like if you're taking... If you're taking mortars, more than likely you're not going to take a light mortar. So, um, which, I mean, medium mortar, you get a bigger template of smoke, but you also will probably want to use that to do some splash damage on somebody, right? So, yeah. Um, but so again, yeah. maybe maybe you don't have, uh, you know, uh, your spotter doesn't have line of sight to something, but you can shoot that ground in front of the thing you're trying to hit yeah. maybe that's you know you take the uh the worst you know you know obviously you'd rather hit it but maybe maybe hitting it with smoke is worth more maybe uh the situation is you hit it you're you're not going to kill enough to take it out and uh if that object gets to shoot you know next turn and it's going to really uh, put your plans in jeopardy or, or take out a vulnerable unit. So, I mean, maybe those situations it's worth a try, but I still don't see it as being reliable. No, no, I don't either. You, uh, you, you definitely have to have a fair bit of it, I think, for it to be really, really effective. And I think that's where, again, the Japanese will shine for that. Um, yeah. And effective or not, if you have just mass, then it, it's going to do something for you, but totally. But there's no way your French are shooting their howitzers as smoke. No, no, no yeah. way. When you can kill a squad, yeah. Basically, usually, if you hit, you're killing a squad. Yeah. So you can true. kill a squad or 
put smoke in front of or on the squat, that doesn't make any sense. No, Again, I, I'd rather maybe, use I'd rather use my V, you know, the VB launchers, right? So, yeah, but but you're saying again, maybe if you have nothing else to shoot at, if you have no line of sight on the target, maybe there's a way for you to obscure their line of sight to something. Maybe that's worth it, but probably not. I mean, most games you're going to have shots if you've placed them right. And if you have your spotters out and whatnot, you're you're hopefully okay anyway. But yeah, no, it's valid valid points. No, for sure. So yeah, I guess that's uh, that's kind of the gist of it for smoke. I guess um, I'm sure we somebody else might have an, uh, a different idea on it, or maybe you agree disagree with it. Um, let tell us, know. Tell let us know. why Eddie's wrong. Yes. No, I just <laughs> yes. Let me know. Uh, maybe you have another idea with it. So, um, like I said, we don't we don't really see too much of it in our game in our local group. But that's about to change. So, <laughs> throw throw some guys for a whirl. Eh? What are you doing? No, I'm play, placing smoke. What? <laughs> well, you're. I'm thinking your French army could technically <laughs> lay down a lot of smoke. Yeah, there's um... two two uh, howitzers and your. All your BBs. Well, there's uh, there's units that actually get multiple. I think there's actually a uh, VB launcher unit, so I could get like ten of them in a unit. Jesus Christ! Just yeah, thump, 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 thump. right. So there you go. Um. So yeah, it's kind of. Um. I might have to try it. So, but uh, next up. I guess is I think this is even more so rare than smoke is the outflanking maneuver. Uh, I I do know I have tried it once way back when. Uh have I seen it against me? Never. Oh, have you played Dustin? I've played Dustin, but I've never played Dustin and he's used this. Oh, he, he's the master of this with his uh, LRDG army mm. coming in the side with those, uh, you know, attacking the flanks with those freaking trucks of machine gun death. Yep. Just murdering my poor old army. <laughs> Yeah, I can see well, it being very effective, especially with those trucks. Yeah, and I think that's the ticket. I know you're going to read uh, or, or go through what exactly it is, but, but people should keep in mind, I think the more mobile your army is, the more uh, opportunity this rule has for you. It's not saying that it can't work with other units like uh, or slower you know, maybe more infantry-based armies, but I think uh, the mechanized, the, uh, you know, guys in the trucks or the trucks, you know, the, yeah, the uh, vehicles mobile. themselves, the yeah. those guys can really rip in, you know, head to the objective or head to, uh, uh, you know, primary, uh, you know, kill shot setups, you know. I think uh, that's probably their the best use of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you do your, your thing. Yeah, no, for sure. So, um, uh, I, I do agree with Jason on that. Um, uh, what he quoted there. So, um, but yeah, outflanking maneuver. If, if you guys aren't sure exactly what it is, uh, pretty much any of your reserves, um, can do this. They can go on an outflanking maneuver. So initially you pick left or right. And you secretly write down, um, you know, either one or both, you know, if you want to split your forces. Um, so whatever units you want to put in reserve to do this, that's, that's where you decide it. And you secretly write this down. Um, on turn one and two, you have to give these units a down order. They don't come on. 
turn three is when it starts. So uh, turn three is when you can order them on the table using the same rules as reserve. So, you know, the minus one to your, uh, pretty much to your morale, to your leadership. Um, but if they do come on, they can deploy up to 24 inches from whatever side that you uh, decide to go on, um, you know, up to 24 inches from like your board edge, you could deploy up. So there's that. Uh, on turn four, if they come on, it increases. So you have 36 inches. And then on turn five, you go up to 48 inches and so on. So um, if you're patient enough, you know, and you want to bring some units in late game, um, they will definitely rush up there and, and be in that section wherever you want them, you know, need them kind of thing or Maybe it's one of those missions that you need to get off the table edge and, you know, they, uh, they're pretty much right <laughs> there. Right. So, uh, there is that option. Um, again, mobile units coming on the board, like Jason said, very, very powerful for that. Um, tactic wise. I mean, if you have units that are like assault units or have, you know, SMGs or assault rifles, stuff like that. Um, that aren't going to get minuses for the moving and shooting <laughs> could be pretty beneficial doing this. Mm -hmm. um, especially considering that, you know, you get to look at the battlefield before you uh, kind of decide if you're going to do this or not, right? Maybe the left side looks a little bit uh, better for, for cover, for maneuverability, for keeping your boys alive out there, right? Uh, on the tabletop kind of thing. Um, and then utilizing that kind of cover, but also utilizing the fact that you're able to move around and shoot and be a thorn in your opponent's side, or maybe you outflank against his artillery wall that he has on the one side that's kind of been, um, you know, not well protected kind of thing, right? Um, or uh, squeal in at the last minute and... Uh capture an objective that they thought was uh, secure. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. That's, that's a very good point as well. Um, and that's actually probably one of the, one of the probably more important ones is that is, you know, um, being aware the situation for objectives. Like yeah. if you see there's objectives deployed on those, on both sides, it might be worth actually doing, some outflanking with a couple of units to each side. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And may, you know, maybe there's a psychological component too, where your enemy knows, you know, you have it, it's turned to, Oh, well, you didn't even roll for those reserves. Okay. <laughs> I see what's happening. Yep. I see what's happening. Okay. So now they're, they're starting to hold units back that they could have thrown in maybe. Right, so maybe because that's the risk, right? Is that well now you're holding units in reserve for at least three turns. Yeah. How many units are you holding for this flank attack? Yeah. Right. That's going to be you're playing points down. Like uh, so, you, there's a chance you can be overwhelmed. Uh, but maybe that evens out. Maybe the guy sees, oh shit, you have like three units. You know, you have that stupid truck of machine gun death, you know, still in reserve on purpose. I know you're trying to come in now. So I'm going to start pulling back units that I can use to deal with that or to protect that, that you know, near my table edge uh, objective that I thought was uh, secure. And then all of a sudden I got to start pulling back. Uh, maybe there's there's merit there. I see this as being far more uh, applicable and and uh, with a higher rate of success than the the smoke. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, it, and it's a tactic, right? It's a initially, you know, you kind of look at it as, oh, you know, I'm gonna these units are gonna be tied up for this many turns. I'm not gonna have them on the board, right? 
But again, going back to what you just said, Jason, like psychologically as well, if you have so many units that are, you know, outflanking and your, your units or your army on the one on your board is much smaller, that also could get your opponent thinking, I'm going to push, I'm going to, I'm going to go straight and get in there because he doesn't have so many units. Like I'm going to swarm them or, or, you know, whatever, right? that could pull them out of position where they should be going. Yeah. You know, um, thinking that, oh, if I come in and I sweep and and cut them off on this side, he, he's got no support. Who cares if those units come in? They're not going to do anything because they're going to be out of position. Well, your plan is that's what they're doing is they're getting into that position where I want them, right? Yeah. And who knows, throughout the game, people people lose uh, sight of the main goal, right? Uh, they get tunnel vision. Um, m you know, maybe you actually have a tank on your side that is like holding, holding the fort. And they get tunnel vision on trying to take out that tank and not realizing, sorry, man, you got like three veteran squads coming on your side out flanking, right? Yeah, well, poop. You know, like, how are you going to deal with that mid-game? You're probably banged up as it is, right? So, so yeah, it's 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 kind of, it's an interesting uh, tactic and mechanic in the game. Um, most outflanking uh, stuff that I've played in other games, it's, it's literally, um, you put these in, you can get bonuses to get them coming on. Um, and, uh, you would roll randomly to see what side they would come on. Right. Yeah. This so. you get to, uh, plan out a lot more, but then there is still, there's a, a significant risk of them not coming on, especially if you hold out till turn four. Yeah. Yeah. You can come in at uh, 36 or turn five, right. Is 48. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to hold out till turn five. Oh, I failed that roll. Now they're coming in on turn six, most games being six, maybe seven turns. Uh, how? What are they going to be able to do in that time? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's especially where I think the mobility of your force that you put there uh, determines their effectiveness because you can delay it longer. If you put infantry on this on the flank attack, it can work if they come in at 24 or maybe 36. But if you wait till that, they're just not going to be able to do anything. They're not going to be able to get close enough to an objective or whatever. No, one, one turn won't be enough, right? Um, unless unless the objective is that close. To the, to the yeah, unless the objective, if it is the objective is uh, getting off the table edge, A, uh, that, that might not be allowed in the scenario. True. Some scenarios don't allow it. Well, there's, there's that, there's, um, uh, the actual objective, like on the ground that you can, you know, either contest or snag kind of thing. Yeah. There's, there's also, oh, you know what? That enemy unit, it only has like three guys left in it. It's the kill point. Yep. Right. You, yep. Ca you come in there, guns blazing, um, that kind of stuff, um. Uh, There's the other objective where you're trying to, you're picking up the objective and trying to get it off the table edge of your table side. Oh, yeah. Uh, that one's probably going to be a little harder to do because, you know, unless it's like, unless it's been deployed on the far sides of the table edge. Mm -hmm. um, more than likely, it's probably going to be more close to center, and you're going to beeline it from center back. So, but yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um, haven't seen it used too often. Again, probably will have to put it into effect just to try it out and uh, see how it works. I think um, some armies it will work a lot better for. Uh, Americans because they don't get the negative to reserve role. Yeah. Yeah. This would work really well for them. Um, you know, and they have 
some decent transports that have multiple machine guns and stuff like that too, right? So, and 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 see, and that's the thing. Like the Americans, they they're moving and firing without the modifier as well with certain their bars and their um, and their rifles, right? Their I think it was M1 Grands, I think. Um, yeah. So I mean, they're getting a bonus of reserve roll. I don't get the minus. I'm moving on the board. I'm not getting a minus to shoot, so I'm shooting right off the bat. So yeah, works really, really good for them. I'd say. Um, as for some of the other armies, I don't think a lot of them really have anything like that. Um, probably wouldn't use a lot for my French, especially if I'm like trying to outflank with like a tank or something just because of the one man turret. Yeah, you know so. your French might not be terrible though if you have those uh dragoons. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh or you know like put because trucks, you so. have so many cheap infantry. <laughs> you can put a couple of units out and they're not as missed. Yeah, you know. If you play the inexperienced route, for French, because you will, if you buy three, you get the fourth for free. Um, so yeah, there is that option of, of throwing a couple of those inexperienced units. Well, but then yeah, there's experience. Yeah, there's the risk, right? But you put your inexperienced on the table and and uh, you know let your uh, more experienced units uh, do the uh, flanking. Send in the Senegalese, yeah, yeah. With the uh, I forget what those are called. They're big machete uh, deals. Yeah, pretty much machetes. Um, but yeah, because they, they get tough fighter and whatnot, so they'd be good to engage the enemy in close combat if you needed. Um, yeah, but it is uh, it is uh, open to interpretation. Oh, hundred percent. I I don't think the. Uh, I think the mobility is really for the turn four or five holdouts. Mm -hmm. I think you can get away with infantry on uh, if you do the the basic come in at halfway through the table, basically uh, from from the long edges. Right, uh, there might be something to it. You know, I'm just not patient enough, and I'm I'm too timid that I'm going to fail my morale checks. You know my my luck is uh, not always on point. Your luck is not always on point, so we're probably uh, more timid to try it than than most. Only for things that blow up. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, even your Canadian army there, with all your little armor that, transports there. That one, I might, I might uh, try. And those little Bren carriers are actually pretty good gun platforms when I can mm -hmm. roll on with uh, with all those uh, uh, machine gun shots. And then of course you have your... Uh, and then pop out with whatever is yeah. in it. Uh, that can be uh, pretty decent. Possibly. But then man, maybe I'll just fail and uh, not come on at all. They get lost on the way yeah, to the it, it just I know you know you start adding the cost of transports into your army and it starts eating up points and then it's like okay well i don't i don't really have that much on the board but and now i'm committing them to outflanking now i have less board control to start with and yeah. i have less options to use in order to try to take out or pin or damage whatever the scenario may be right so mm -hmm. And then, of course, those units are t taking the hits. So one wrong move, and you just lost a unit, and you're like, "Oof," you know. Yeah. It's it's not like I have sixty uh, miniatures on the board of inexperienced guys, and I'm like, "Yeah, I can sacrifice one unit," you know. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of yeah. I, I hit or miss with some armies. Uh, again, the the Americans. I think this is a great thing to use to try. Um, maybe even the Japanese too, with their whole fanatic thing and 
charging in and all that stuff. Buns I charging, all that crap. Um, this is a fortune favors the bold type scenario yes. you know, type uh, strategy. Yeah, I think if you're doing this uh, outflanking, I mean, okay, so my thought process right now is if you're one of those players that enjoys your armor, your tanks, and, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you do take one of them that's a bit bigger and, and more point value, doing some outflanking with other units in your army really might hamper, you know, um, your ability to take other things out. Uh, also, I mean, if you want to an outflank with a tank, you can, but that's a lot of points stuck in there. Yeah, every um, turn they're not doing something. But maybe with a, uh, if you're playing an early war game, yeah, maybe with a 100-point tank, yep. maybe it's not such a bad idea. A couple machine guns with uh, moderate armor value pops up, you know, somewhere they don't want it. You've been shielded the whole game. Yep. That might not be a bad uh, uh, deal, but most scenarios you can't capture objectives with that. No, but, but you, you are now a flanking threat, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And who knows? Maybe you maybe roll on with a light or a medium anti-tank gun and you get that flank shot. Yeah. Right? Stuff yeah. like that. So lots to think about for it. Lots to try out. Um Again, this is is this is definitely one of the rare, super rare tactics and or maneuvers. Um, i you know you don't see it, really you don't see it. Um, definitely overlooked, and uh, maybe it is guys are just they don't want to commit stuff into an outflank, just for the fact that they simply don't have those toys to play with, right? So, um. But maybe we test it out. You know, one of our games. We can try that out. Try out flanking. See how it works. See if it's beneficial. Maybe it's just crap. Do it. So, otherwise, it's 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 a nice uh, another option, right? It's pretty cool that they have that. Just kind of um, could be thematic in your fights too, right? So, That's just another banana in your toolbox. Yeah. <laughs> you keep bananas in your toolbox? <laughs> Crazy. Um, but yeah, so that was the second topic. <laughs> so uh, our third topic is one that's um, more used often uh, in games. I know I do see it um, a fair bit in our games, so all the players, is the uh, recce rule on vehicles and whatnot. Now, I got to say, the other day I was surprised. I I was very surprised. Um, I was playing our... our Devin is one of our players. She uh, has an Italian, beautiful Italian force that she painted up. Um, Well and fast, too. I'm so mad at her. Yeah. So mad. Good, Great player. Great player. Um, So I ended up targeting a tank of hers, an Italian tank, and she reacted with Reki. And I was like, what? Right? I thought that it was really only like, you know, scout cars and light armored vehicles, like armored cars that had it. But this tank apparently had it. And yeah, it, it, it kind of like blew my mind. I was like, huh, well, that's cool. Right? Um, it was neat because like used it and fell back with it, got out of sight. So my shot was wasted. Her order was wasted. And then like for the rest of the game, both of our tanks didn't even engage each other. Cause it was like, yeah, nope, we're not making our tests. We're not, uh, <laughs> we got pins on each other and we're not doing so well here. So, um, but again, uh, uh yeah, the recce, it, um, gives you a, Another reaction, actually a reaction for the vehicle um, when you're being shot at. So um, it's an escape reaction. So, you know, as long as you haven't been activated your your order dice, you can um, pull a dice out 
and uh, do this escape reaction. And pretty much it's, um, you could advance or run uh, pretty much to get out of sight, um, you know, or as far away as possible as you can, uh, pretty much from the shot coming in or uh, an assault kind of thing, right? So um, some some of the vehicles that do have recce, they are allowed to, um, I think actually all of them actually are allowed to, when they go in reverse, they can do it at full speed, right? It's not half like everybody else when they go down. Well, um, it's just most of those vehicles happen to have those rules. Yeah. Because they're designed for that role. So um, there's also a chance that, because um, usually you can only advance, like when you go in reverse kind of thing, um, but some of them can actually do a run, which yeah. is pretty cool. Um, can't remember what some of the, um, some of the um, keywords or rules are on some of the vehicles, but they got some kind of steering. I can't remember what it is. But um, it's a pretty neat ability. It's your that unit becomes like a pest in the game. <laughs> to put yeah. it, put it best, uh, you know, um, they're good at at uh, sighting hidden troops as well. Their range is larger, and yep. um, yeah, there it's all it's it's always it's one of those units in the game that okay, you know it has recce, you know if you target it. It's going to use it back away and it's going to waste your shot. You know, if you don't target it, it's going to get a shot off somehow, right? The, the opponent will wait for the very last moment and then use it, right? So I know, Jason, you've used it a lot. Yep. Yep. You know, and you've used it actually quite effectively. So my uh, airborne Jeep is the bane of uh, many people's existence. Yep. Uh, with its 10 shots and uh, with the, what do you call it, the double Vickers uh, mount, dual Vickers machine gun mount. The MMGs, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, I can uh, roll around. I use it to suck up people's dice. Because sometimes people will shoot at it knowing I'm going to recce, but just forcing me to use my dice, yeah. you know, to to use their action for that, essentially. Uh, but in my mind, it's a trade-off, you know. It's the uh, knight sacrificing itself to take out the bishop kind of deal uh, for a turn. Uh, I mean, also, just... Uh, having kind of like a, a veil of invulnerability almost. As long as you're careful with it, you save that dice for last. I mean, it doesn't always work out. Sometimes the dice gods, you know, they still have four units left, you know, and you're all out of dice. And they mess you up, yeah. But, uh, but as long as you're careful with it, it, it really can be invulnerable. I will say the biggest weakness isn't so much the enemy, it's that you play it too careful. Yep. Uh, and you don't take advantage of, and most of these things have a machine gun or, or a light, you know, anti tank gun or something. They, they generally aren't uh, super weapons, but can be really just a pain in the butt. Yeah for the people you're playing, if you play it right. And it can soak up a lot of energy that is really unwarranted. For instance, I, I can't remember exactly, but my Jeep is something like 45 points or something like that. Yeah, it's a mobile machine gun platform. That it's, it's not worth a whole lot of points, but oh my gosh, do I see, like, people are, like, throwing everything they can to try to kill this stupid thing, which is great. And if they succeed, I guess, well, that sucks, but uh, you know, every shot they take at it and, and miss is a shot they're not shooting at, uh, you know, somebody else. Yeah. 
And then you have, um, I guess you have like the kind of, you know, this is kind of how you, uh, we use it and, and kind of what we've seen and whatnot and in games, but like, you know, going against it, you know, how are you kind of countering it? Right. And you usually have to use multiple units to try to take it out. Right. Yeah. Um, you you got to force their hand. You got to force them to use their maneuver. But you also got to be in position to be able to target it with something else that hasn't acted yet. Now. Or, Andy, mm -hmm. ambush. Yes. If you ambush while it's making its recce move already and you activate the, you know, so he, sh you shoot at it with something. And it starts doing its recce move, and then you ambush it. You get to choose the point at which you engage that unit with your firepower. True. So that ambushing unit gets the shots. Yeah, so I you're, mean, you're planning a way ahead. It's difficult right. to do, or to plan out that way, but it can happen. It has happened. Yeah, no, it, that's that's a very good point. That's a, actually a really good point too. Um, I know I don't use ambush enough, um, but for recce vehicles, that's actually a really really good point. I never even thought of that really. Um, I was thinking more of like you know um, moving and positioning your units to be able to actually do like just regular shooting against. Yeah. Which is certainly a, a thing to do also. The other thing that the truth is, most of my recce vehicles have been destroyed when I take a risk mm. because there's a target that I just need to kill and I, I go for it. You know what I mean? Where I'm just like, I know I'm probably going to die, right. but I need to target X unit because it's going to do X thing or they're on the objective. And if I can clear the objective, my infantry can run up and, or whatever. Right. And I do it and then they get smoked, but I pretty much kind of know that that was a risk. And I've, I, I've had that happen a lot to me. And that's how I see most people that I play against their recce vehicles get destroyed when they make those moves where they know it's not the best move for the protection of the vehicle, but they feel that it's important enough to risk. And then it doesn't work out for them. And they, they explode in a fireball. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, I mean, almost always, it has to be 80% of recce vehicles getting destroyed are because of a willingness like a, a willing risk taken by that recce vehicle. I mean, yeah. otherwise they're really quite difficult. You're, you're not often going to catch it with the ambush tactic. And as long as you're smart about where they recce to, you're probably not going to, you're going to have to have a really spread out force to be able to have all these multiple, you know, fire angles on it, no matter where it goes. Right. Very true. I so uh, I was thinking about that too because usually, like that recce vehicle is usually on their side of the board, like you know, hugging a corner, um, just planted somewhere where if they do use recce, they are like breaking line of sight to most things, right? That kind of thing. Um, or you know if. Everybody's gone and they have the opportunity. Again, they're hugging that corner of a building or something and they have clear line of sight for a shot and they take it, right? So being able to line up that second unit to take the shot on the recce after the recce maneuver has been made. Um, Pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah. Not very common. It's it's very, um, very true what, what Jason said about usually it's the owning player may, taking that risk. Yeah, it's, or, it's or even, uh, yeah, even, uh, you know, the anti-tank gun fires at your recce vehicle, but you choose not to recce because you want to use it 
you know, you still want to use that dice for something else. And yeah. you risk it. You think to you in your head, oh, he needs a five or a six to hit. Uh, is that's not going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. Screw, well, screw guess it. what? I'm going to risk it. It, it, it does. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been there way too often. I get too cocky and be like, nope. Uh, he needs sixes to hit me. I'm I'll let it go. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Right. Yeah, but maybe if you're playing a scenario where kill points aren't, you know, a contributing factor to victory or loss. I mean, maybe that's worth the risk, but True. that's what happens is people kill themselves. True. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's got to look at it as, is it worth me firing that light anti-tank gun or wasting that guy's shot? Right. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, overall there's a, uh, there's a lot of recce vehicles out there for armies, um. I'm sure almost every army has at least one. I um, I think they do. I think it's fairly universal. And they're all, I mean, ranging from Jeeps to, you know, light armored vehicles to yep. even a couple of tanks. Yep. Uh, or motorcycles. Oh, yeah, that's true. The sidecars yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And they yeah. can just be, they're just a, uh, a pain in the butt slash game winning vehicle occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally yeah. it's the guy I mean, they're the one that that uh rip out, out of nowhere, machine gun your three guys that heroically defending that objective, and then uh, you know, your infantry jogs up and takes the credit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it does happen that way. We've we've seen it quite a few times, you know, taking, totally. out, taking out the commander, taking out a commissar or something like that. Right. Something silly. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Good little review on that as well. Um, and then of course you, um, you just gave me some ideas for another episode, uh, Calvary and whatnot. Um, but Ooh. yeah, <laughs> somebody I know has, uh, Quite a bit of Polish cavalry. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, some good good topics today. Um, some good insight and uh, a couple of eye openers as well, which is great. Uh, we love talking about this kind of stuff. Hopefully, this uh, would help you guys out there and gals. You know, um, kind of realize there is these things in the game of bolt action. Um, you may not see it as often, or you, maybe you want to try it out yourself uh, and it'd be great to hear back from you guys and see what you guys, uh, think about it. And maybe, you know, maybe we've missed something completely and you have a great idea of, of how to use a tactic or how to use, you know, outflanking or smoke or a recce vehicle, whichever it is. Yeah. Um, Anything you can do to help me win more games <laughs> would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting to um, to see. Like, I wonder how um, in tournaments um, we have two gentlemen going to LVO uh, next year. They're going to the Bolt Action uh, Tournament, so um, it'll be good to to get back with them, maybe uh, try to get one of them on the show here and uh, the experience. Debrief. Yeah, exactly. But I wonder how often you actually see that in some of the competitive gaming too, right? Or the tournament gaming. Because um, I don't quite know if LVO is really a competitive, uh, you know, showdown. Um, I know there's a couple other podcasts I've heard and they, they do talk a lot about... Uh, a lot of tournaments that they go to uh, in the UK and whatnot. And um, there is a fair bit of them that are a little bit uh, competitive. So, um, but I don't think as much as some of the other uh, mainstream systems as well. So, um, but yeah, overall, uh, pretty good uh, intel. And uh, thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Please send pics, uh, check out Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Leave feedback. Um, we love hearing feedback. Uh, helps us make everything better for us. 
um, gives us ideas for, for stuff for the show and uh, also uh, just shows appreciation of, uh, you know, people actually listening and, and we'd love to comment back on on uh, your guys' posts and have a little bit of chatter with each other and yeah, and we go from there. So uh, again, Jason, thanks so much for joining again, being my battle buddy. Uh, no problem. On the show and on the tabletop. So next time I'll make sure I uh, have a successful charge against your infantry. <laughs> so maybe that fence wouldn't stop me this time. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to get working on my Confederates so we can have uh, a proper battle. So <laughs> excellent. But. Um, but yeah, and thanks, uh, thanks everybody for joining and listening. And uh, again, if you like it, thumbs up, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you're streaming your podcasts and stuff. So until next time, we'll catch you guys later. See you. Trident Wargaming. Build it, paint it, play it.